We are now streaming live on the internet. Thank you. Do you mind do another mic check again, please? You sound great. Whatever you did worked. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Sure. Your clerk today will be Colin Cooch. Good afternoon, Ms. Esther Stone. Would you like to do a mic check? Good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez. Oh, sorry. Hello. Can we do a mic check for Larry Stone? Absolutely. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.
Oh, Supervisor Hi. Lee, your, your microphone is muted or it's not plugged in. I can't quite tell what. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Or, I heard someone. No, I don't think, I think that was Steve Mitra. Yes, Otto, we, we can't hear you. Yes, Chairperson Lee, your mic is not picking up any sound. You may not be able to hear us either. Should I, I'll just text him. Colin, I just shot him a text to see if that would help. Okie dokie. He, his mic check earlier went through, so. Um... It's the gremlins. <laughs> That's what I think. Now, uh, Chairperson Lee, I hear buzzing, but I don't hear your voice. So Otto, when you take your mic off, it buzzes, but we still can't hear you. Next to the microphone icon is a, a carrot of some sort. If you click on that, it'll allow you to select a different microphone or speaker. Perhaps you have a secondary option like the built-in one or a external USB. Nothing yet. Oh, oh, we can hear you now. Oh, really? Okay, so whatever it is, it was great. Okay, we'll we'll keep it going. Recording in progress. Goes wrong. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your patience, everybody. Uh, now they hear me. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the uh, old, uh, the meeting of the August nineteenth uh, Finance and Government Operations Committee to order. And again, my name is Supervisor Otto Lee. I'm honored to chair the FGOC along with my co-chair, Supervisor Sidney Chavez today. At this time, I would like to ask members of the committee to introduce themselves, starting with our County Executive Officer. Hello, my name is uh, Jeff Smith. I'm the County Executive, County of Santa Clara. Hi, good afternoon, Miguel Marquez, Chief Operating Officer. Hello, good afternoon. Greg Etria, County Budget Director. Steve Mitra, Assistant County Council. Glenn Williams, Asset and Economic Development. Okay, thank you. And with both supervisors present, could the clerk please do a roll call to establish that we have a quorum? Vice Chairperson Chavez. Here. And Chairperson Lee. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. And this takes us to the first item of our agenda. Our first item of agenda, of course, is uh, public comments, which is reserved for persons wanting to address the committee on any matter that's not on this agenda. Members of the public who wish to address the committee on any item not listed on the agenda should request to speak at this time. Individuals will be called to speak in turn. Speakers are limited to the following three minutes. Uh, if there are five or fewer persons, in two minutes, if there are six to 14 people, 
and then over 15 will just adjust to one minute. The law does not permit committee action or extended discussion on any item not on the agenda, except under special circumstances. If the committee action is requested, the committee may place the matter on the future agenda. Statements that require response may be referred to staff for reply and writing. Clerk, would you please let me know how many speakers we have for public comment, please? We currently have one request to speak. Great, and then let's go set for three minutes. Three minutes. All right. The next speaker is Scott Largent. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. And the timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, Scott Largent. I'm sitting at my uh, computer right now, just going through old documents involving predatory tow companies in the uh, city of, well, I'm sorry, in Santa Clara County. Oh, Scott, I don't oh, are you there? I think we just lost Scott. We might have lost Scott. His microphone is still active, but I'm not hearing anything from him. Hmm. Scott, oh, there, you go, there you are. Scott, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I, I'm here. The timer stopped on the phone at 2 minutes and 54 seconds. I, oh, where'd he go? Oh. Oh, there you Scott, you got kicked out. I'm gonna kick you. I'm gonna kick you back in. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to bring you back in here. In a nonviolent way. Yeah. <laughs> I think you got you got your uh, internet dropped out for a second, Scott. I, but uh, I think you're back in. So go ahead and proceed. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I have a hot spot out here that I'm using, and I and I think that's probably the problem. It's not on your guys' end. Um, I do appreciate you restarting the uh, the clock and working with me. What I've been doing is researching more about the predatory tow companies, and I'm trying to, um, you know, I've been trying to light a fire underneath the public defender's office for over five years now. Um, it seems like they are coming to the table right now. They have a good amount of clients that have dealt with the same things that I have dealt with. Um, these companies were violating state law and they were taking vehicles all the way across town to East side, San Jose. Um, you know, it was very cruel too, because people couldn't get out there. They didn't know where they were going. Um, it was just a mean, cruel joke, you know, only giving people five, 10 minutes to get their belongings. Um, I would have hoped that our district attorney would have gone after these companies uh, 10 years ago. They did go after towing companies, um, but I I'm just curious why they don't want to do that now. I know Santa Clara County has a problem with these RVs. I, I, I get it, but these are homes for people that can't afford the traditional route. Um, I had an eviction years back. It's, it's a tough thing to have on your record. It's very difficult to get into a place. And, and my RV is my home. My, my RV is really, really neat. It's great during my sobriety. You know, I can do my visits with my daughter over Zoom. And even though I get to see her every day now in person, it, it oh, Scott, the uh, same thing has just happened. If you can hear me. See if you can log in real quick here. Um, there we go. Oh, Scott, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Okay. It, it, it's it, it's no worries, guys. If it's going to be choppy, I don't want to disrupt the meeting too much. You guys know what I'm talking about with the towing thing. And and when you get a chance, read a little bit on San Jose Spotlight. They actually ran an article about the towing companies. And the next article that's going to come out is going to involve um, how the public defender's office kind of leaves people high and dry. So um, we don't need to worry about any more technical difficulties, and I'll let you get on with your meeting. Appreciate everything. Thank you. All right. Um, that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Now we move to item number three, which is approving the consent calendar and changes to the committee's agenda. The items removed from the consent calendar will be considered at the end of the regular agenda for discussion. The committee may also add items from the regular agenda to the consent calendar. There is no separate discussions of the consent calendar items, and the recommended actions are voted on in one motion. If an item is approved on consent vote, the specific action recommended by staff is adopted. 
members of the public who wish to address the committee on consent calendar items to comment on this item. Each speaker is limited to two minutes total. So Vice Chair uh, Chavez, I have the following changes to the agenda and please let me know if you are amenable to them. One is adding items 7, 13, and 14 to consent. And to have items 6 and 9 to be heard concurrently. And then I would like to also request for item 10 relating to an update on the Office of Sheriff Staffing Study conducted by CGL companies to be deferred at this time to the meeting of September 16, 2021 FGOC meeting. And the reason why is that way back in December uh, 12, 2017, um, before I was on the board, uh, you introduced a referral requesting administration to procure a staffing study for the county jails. Part of the referral emphasized the need to understand career ladders and pathways for existing staff working in the jails to improve, quote, morale, career satisfaction, motivation, productivity, and responsiveness in meeting organizational objectives. And that, in light of the jail reform efforts and the possibility of building a new jail facility or other facilities, understanding the needs of incarcerated individuals and staffing will help contribute to jail conditions and likely long term cost savings. A year later, on December 4, 2018, the administration provided the board with a report regarding the scope of the work for the RFP that will respond to your referral, which also address career ladders opportunities to address well being of staff and the staffing analysis, including skill set for other positions such as rehab officers and methods by which staffing may be scaled as the population adjusts up and down, opportunities to enhance staffing options and alternatives within the office of sheriff. In the preceding six months, staff went back and forth incorporating a feedback from the board to finalize the scope of the work for the RP. Uh, on July 2019, the admin provided an office agenda memo to the board with information on which referrals relating to the jail study were projected to receive responses and which were not explanations for the non-responses and information on custody health service as related to medical behavior and other services provided in the jail from other departments. Eventually, the board approved the contract with CGL in the amount of 281000 and change. So my understanding is that the contract was terminated with CGL on April 2021. A draft report was provided to the county and that 225k of the taxpayer dollars was paid to the vendor. So despite significant board direction and staff time spent uh, on top of the money being spent and, rec and repeated requests of the CGL jail staffing study uh, by multiple supervisors, uh, four years later, since the original referral was approved, staff has made the decision not to respond to a board as a whole request for the jail staffing study results. Uh, for saying that the results of jail staff study was not helpful to re inform the board of its decision making that was conducted prior to COVID 19. I certainly appreciate staff and the hard work, but this support pre that preserves the right to determine whether or not to use any information uh, included in the CGL jail study, uh, jail staff and study to make any type of decisions. Um, so, what I would like to do is to ask to defer this item. To September 16, 2021 FGOC meeting and request once again for staff to provide the, the uh, CGL companies jail staffing study and result as part of the agenda item for our review. Um, and lastly, um, I would like to defer item number 12 to the Office of the Sheriff's Outreach and Recruitment efforts to September 16th FGOC as well to allow us to uh, more time to review and consider possible next steps. And so that leads the following item to be heard today, which is item number four, item number six, and item number nine. <laughs> and then going back together by item eight, 11, 15, and 16. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did miss that. So um, we, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear all of sure. that. Let me let me let me start again. Um, so first is adding seven, thirteen, fourteen to consent. We got that. Right. And then having items six and nine to be heard concurrently. Mm -hmm. And as far as deferment, we're also deferring ten. Deferring 
12. Okay. Oh, and that's all? Yeah. That's okay. All. So I'm going to, I apologize. I, I'm having a difficult time hearing you, but I'm going to do my best to, sure. to give feedback to that. Yes, please. So um, item four, I'm just going to start from the top, is a report from ESA um, regarding executive recruitment. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I'd like to request a deferral um, because I, I need to have a discussion with council about that item. Do you want, do you want a date certain or just uh, leave it open? I think that the September uh, 16th meeting would be fine. Okay, I'm agreeable. Thank with you. you. Sure. And then item five is on consent? Uh, yes, we have okay. asked to put uh, that on consent. I just uh, want to make sure, okay, consent. And then item six and nine would be heard together. Item seven, uh, just again, so I understand this. Item seven, you would like to have on consent? Item seven. Item seven, okay, consent yes. also, okay. Uh -huh. And then item eight, you want on consent also? Uh, no, we, we are going to hear eight and nine. You wanna hear eight, okay. Um, and then item 10, I, I just wanna um, say that I'm very, supportive of the direction you put forward and that at the next meeting um I, I think they attached it to the full board but i would like to make sure that all referrals referencing the staffing study are presented in the board packet um, at the next meeting thank you um and then item 11 you're leaving on the regular agenda yes okay and then item 12, um, you're gonna defer. Correct. Okay. And then items 13, 14, and 15 will all be on consent? That's correct. Okay. 13, um, 14, I, uh, we're gonna hear 15, I think. You wanna hear 15? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, item 16, we're gonna hear. Correct. Okay. Then um, on item um, 18, this is a monthly report um, based on an audit that was done of the Los Altos Hills um, you know, Fire Department. And there are two issues that I wanna just raise from this. I'd like to leave it on consent, but I'd like the, the, um, the um, staff to come back. And by this, this could be our auditor to report back on the, only on the outstanding items of the eucalyptus trees being um, addressed, and also just to better understand what our expectations should be on the completion of the records. I recognize there was a COVID issue, but I but the reason I would like the staff to report back at our next meeting on these is that this report, um, having it done on a monthly basis, was in part based on past experience with Los Altos um, uh, Hills, you know, the the fire um, district. But I, but I think they've really been moving in a great direction and I don't wanna misuse their time, but I do wanna make sure I understand the um, issues, the outstanding issues only. I think it's great to credit everything they're doing, that's great. But just to put those outstanding issues on a timeline. So if the auditor uh, could work with Los Altos Hills um, County Fire District, I think that would be really beneficial for our next meeting because what I'd like to be able to do is take it off of a monthly, re monthly um, report out and make it um, annual, but I but I do want those issues that are still outstanding um, put to a timeline. Is there any concern from staff on that request? No, Super Rutherford, that's fine. Okay, great, thank you. Hey, thank that you. I'd make a motion. All right, and I will second that. And if um, Let's, let's, uh, oh, actually, I do need to open public uh, hearing first. So let's open the public. Does anybody like to speak on this issue, please? There are no requests to speak. Okay, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and go ahead and take the vote, please. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Aye. Thank you. All right, so the first item after this uh, discussion will be item number six. Am I correct? Okay. All right. 
and, the, and as I said earlier, item six and nine are to be heard together. And this is to receive a report from the Management Audit Division relating to the fiscal year 21-23 recommended budget and receive a report from the Office of the County Executive relating to a subset of recommendations from the Harvey Rose Associates review of the fiscal year 21-23 County Exec recommended budget where there was not concurrence by administration, which was a referral from the June 14 uh, board meeting. Here to present these items on behalf of the administration, I believe is Cheryl Sola and staff. Am I correct? Cheryl, are you here? Yes. I'm sorry, I need to. Can you see my screen? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Me. Um, so um, this is, I'll just try to keep it brief, but I, I just wanted to um, sort of articulate a little bit about kind of the background around how there can be disagreements um, from the administration in our office pertaining to the budget amounts. And um, so as you can see here, this is the actual general fund budget versus actual for the object services and supplies, which is basically the county's contracts. So in the general fund for 2021, that is the year that just ended June 30. And as you can see, there's about 280 million that was appropriated by the board, but unexpended and unencumbered at the end of the year. So what we try to do in, in our projections for the, the upcoming budget, we're trying to look for what in this case is the 280 million to try to identify that and lay that out as an option for the board so that the board is aware of that there may be funds available that could be used to go back into services. And we try to avoid having any kind of recommendations associated with some with appropriations that would be used for actual services or encumbrances that would be used for actual services or goods or um, so it's the difference between our report and what the administration says is is the is where they're saying in this case you know the money is in the gray box and we're saying it's in the red box and so that's what the difference is in some budget circumstances if you took money out of the budget, you could be cutting actual services, but that's not what we're trying to do. And that's, and we don't believe that our recommendations do that in any way. What we're trying to do is find an effort to ensure that allocated monies maximize actual services by identifying un, you know, unspent monies or projecting monies that may be unspent to the end of the year. Um, and so this chart that I have here, I'm sorry, I don't know why this stuff is in the way, but um, this is actually from the OBA response and it just lays out what OBA's position was relative to our findings. And I'm happy to go through, I did prepare a separate memo um, to look at with three, three additional months of expenditure data, um, that being June, July, and, um, or actually, um, yeah, June, July, and August um, monies. Oh, there's nothing that we identified in the sort of re-examination of this that would lead us to think that, you know, something is wrong with these estimates and and to be frank we're pretty we're pretty conservative about trying to identify funds that you know we really think are not going to be expended on what they've been laid out for appropriations um so i don't know if you want to go one by one or if if there are particular questions 
Uh, yeah, I don't necessarily think we need to go by one by one, but I think, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the report. And so if there are any questions and the comments after that, we could ask individually and the public certainly can comment as well. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, so you were saying that you did want to go one by one? I mean, you can if you think it's necessary. I mean, I think it's all there. Uh, if you yeah. if like to highlight the ones individually, then it's probably better than just go through every single one. Yeah, so, you know, as, as I said, you know, I don't see any changes in any of the expenditures at, uh, as of the last, you know, as of June 30th or you know, in the first month of this year, um, that would make us think that something was wrong with our estimates. And so I think they're still solid estimates. And, you know, it's those funds we believe will be available at the end of the year. Um, if they aren't used for something else, they'll end up in fund balance and could be addressed then or at mid year or later potentially good afternoon this is greg Utria, county budget director this is uh, the appropriate time uh, i could also share administration's view of of, of this report and provide uh, uh, overall commentary and perhaps that will help the committee uh, 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 you know, formulate the ideas how to proceed with this conversation. Um, you know, overall, the management auditor or the, or the HMR uh, an analysis, uh, in our view, is uh, too focused on historic accounting reports and doesn't appear to even attempt to analyze expected costs for the current fiscal year. We have reached out to departments um, mentioned here in the last couple of days, there doesn't appear to have been a, an attempt to understand the impacts of a reduction in board authority or board appropriations um, uh, that's contained in the budget. And further, the, the Harvey Rose team uh, appears to be looking at the budget as if it's a cash flow projection rather than a record of board authorization for the expenditure of public funds for services and, and infrastructure, which is its most formal purpose. And not prepared to, you know, to go you know, proposal by proposal to describe the significant considerations that were missed in, the, in, in this Harvey Rose review, uh, the impacts to services and critical infrastructure if the board was to reduce uh, spending authority you know, on, uh, to, to these extent. So that way the committee is you know, fully informed of what the anticipated impacts would be from reducing spending authority um, you know, in these budgets and for these services. Let, me add, the, let me add a couple yeah. of things. Um, <clears throat> I think the issue really is the difference between allocations and planning versus historical spending. And there are three uh, major areas that I'd like to point out where there's difference. If you look at number eight, which is behavioral health services contracts, <clears throat> the Harvey Rose um, organization recommended reallocating about $25 million based on the historical fact that many of these contracts do not spend their full um, um, maximum financial obligation um, in some years. Um, we believe that there needs to be flexibility for the CBOs and the clinics to be able to um, see patients and provide services. Some years they don't um, spend their entire uh, budget. Some years they do um, by reallocating it at in July, the board would effectively uh, foreclose the possibility of uh, services expanding beyond the projected number, which means that people would need to be turned away. I think the board has re currently 
um, been told by the CBOs in behavioral health that cutting their budgets would cause great harm to their ability to plan, uh, the ability to hire new providers, their ability to plan for new programs. Um, and so um, actually reducing their allocation by 25 million would decrease the services ability for them to function. The other um, major portion of the savings that uh, um, Harvey Rose is talking about is in number five. <clears throat> These are allocations for capital projects like the VASC, the um, other capital projects that the board has put high priority upon. Um, if those funds are reallocated to another <clears throat> project or another operational expenditure that would stall projects considerably because they would be defunded. Um, so that uh, does not recognize the fact that project planning is uh, a dynamic situation. There's oftentimes um, subsequent work allowances and subsequent projects. And for example, the um, psychiatric, new psychiatric facility initially was projected to cost about $300 million. Now it's projected to cost $400 million if we had defunded um, the program to actually what was actually spent last year, uh, we would have paralyzed the program. And that's true of many of the other capital expenditures. And then the next <clears throat> large number is the um, funding for vacant positions. Um, I think the board understands that many positions are created because of critical needs during the time period that recruitment is being done. Um, there needs to be an allocation in order to be able to hire somebody into those positions. Without that allocation, um, there would be no ability to actually hire into those positions. We routinely, every year in OPA, look through all of the positions that have been vacant for more than two years and we report to the board about um, which vacancies we think should be eliminated but there are a number of vacancies that need to be kept kept funded as we go through the hiring process so this money is necessary for the function of the organization um, and should not be reallocated to other operations Craig, did you have more to say? Yeah, not unless we want to get into, you know, specific line items. Um, you know, uh, maybe one other point would be, and it's, it's not factored in the, the earlier math that uh, uh, Harvey Rose showed, is there are a number of projects the board funds on a one-time basis that take multiple years to complete. And only they're maybe only uh, partially completed last year. And we have what's called the, the rollover process where we'll be coming to the board in September, asking the board to, to reappropriate. So some of the uh, amounts that the difference between last year's actual uh, spend and the budgeted amounts that were shown as available aren't truly available unless the board changes its mind about a lot of these very critical one-time expenditures and programs, which I've got listed <laughs> if, if on a line by line base, if the board wants to hear which ones would be cut, if, if the board wanted to cut, but I'm, it, it would just be an exercise because uh, we have high confidence based on the current um, messages from the board that everything I would be mentioning is, is a high priority at the board, but I've got those notes if the board wants to, if the committee wants to go line item by line item. That's all I have at this point. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you have anything else on this? No, thank oh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, let me ask if my colleague, uh, Supervisor Chavez, do you have any questions on this item? 
Um, I, I actually do. And, you know, one, one challenge I would say is that, um, one, I really appreciate, uh, Cheryl, you give, giving us some additional information. And what I would say, um, Dr. Smith and, and um, Mr. Iteria, that the, you know, the back and forth is actually, I think is pretty important on some of these issues. And I, I just want to say um, a couple of, uh, I want to make a couple of recommendations. And I do think this should come back to the full board for discussion uh, as it, it should have been done during budget. But one of the challenges was I felt like we had already had so many moving parts during the budget that it made sense for this to come to FGOC. Um, and I, I want to start, Dr. Smith, with the, um, or Cheryl, I, you know, to get your thoughts on this, but on item one, the funding of the vacant positions, the way from reading um, uh, Cheryl's presentation uh, that was available to us in, in our packets is that it looked to me that the percentage that, that, um, that the OBA, um, I'm sorry, that our auditors are put forward is rel a relatively small slice of the overall resources available and that they were still within the, the annual percentages that we maintain to keep the float that wouldn't frankly stop us from hiring people. And as my understanding is that that number, the number was something akin to $80 million. I might be confusing that with line item five, but if it's $80 million, Cheryl, I guess my question to you is what percentage, why did you all choose such a, a low percentage? Because based on what I understand you to be presenting, if this would be 10 million of, of 80 million that you really believe is available. Um, thank you, Supervisor. Yes, we, we, again, we try to be very conservative to make sure that we're not, I'll uh, go back to this. Um, oops. So, you know, something, we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're never, in, if you're looking at your screen, we're never touching these kinds of, um, the stuff that's in the gray where there are actual services. And we're just looking at, you know, uh, barring some sort of actual catastrophe, um, funds that would be truly available. We never want to touch um, service monies that would be tied to, to services. Um, and so that's why it, yes, it's conservative. What's the, I guess, Cheryl, just so I'm not guessing, how, why 10 million of the, I understand being conservative, but is there a, a framework you're using that we have enough money based on the, the policies that we have in place to have, um, to have enough resource so that we're able to um, continue the work, you know, that, that I think it was a 2.6 uh, percentage points of um, resources available if there's 80 million available, why 10 million? Is there a, an accounting well, mechanism you're using or is this, what is so, it? So part of the reason that this was presented so conservatively is because the administration did reduce um, quite a few vacant positions, the funding for quite a few vacant positions. And because at the end of the year, the actual savings at as of June 30th um, was about $20 million in, you know, on the general fund side, which is pretty close under a, you know, so we're, we're just trying to be cautious. We don't want to ever put anything out there that would be potentially needed for services. Um, and so this is half of what it actually was at the end of, as of June 30th, at the end of that year. So you chose half. I don't mean to use this term, but you you just sort of chose half because there there it wasn't a a rule necessarily. This was a judgment that you made based on what you thought was conservative. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then um, my next question um, really goes. I'm going to go to the behavioral health um, services contract. 
you know, Dr. Smith, I, I don't think that by, I, I don't think that the removing this necessarily would halt uh, con halt services. I, I do think the point you're raising, though, that you want enough flexibility in this fund, I think, because we are looking at expanding services in this area, and some of those expansions are going to happen over this, that are, are not going to happen necessarily at the formal budget times, because we're responding to a number of emergencies right now. Um, does that, is that accurate? That's part of it, but I think the most important part of it for the CBOs is that they need to have the ability to hire um, very expensive clinicians. And in order to do that, they have to have a reliable um, source of funding. We know that, for example, it's very difficult to hire psychologists and psychiatrists. And part of the reason that they've underspent their uh, allocated maximum financial um, liability is because they haven't been able to hire. If we take away the allocation, they guaranteed are not going to be able to hire because they have no ability to plan. Um, and, you know, we have every year um, consistent concerns expressed by the behavioral health contractors about their ability to plan unless they have reliable sources of funding. So we feel from an administrative perspective, if we cut those contract maximum financial obligations, um, we will create an ability, inability for them to actually provide services. But you're right, we're trying to expand services. So at the time that we're trying to expand, is definitely not the time to type to contract the budget. I think that that this was another one, Dr. Smith. That that on my, I, I understand your point, and I understand the underspending in large part is due to the lack of ability to hire. I think that, and what staff, what the um, what Harvey Rose is showing is the the underexpending of up to between 36 and 60 million each year. And I, I do really attribute a lot of that to hiring. I guess what I'm wondering is um, when we're looking at this number, is this number, uh, and maybe this is something that you all will have to get back to us on, but is this number in, in I'm sorry, this number is a part of the services that we've contracted. So really long, the recommendation from uh, Harvey Rose is to, um, is to make these contracts smaller because we have an, an over, right, that's over correct. contracting. I mean, let me, I'm asking Dr. Smith, I just want to ask Cheryl if, if that's the way she understands her recommendation to us. Um, well, and I, in the follow-up memo, I tried to be clear about this. There, it's it's not a hundred percent clear that these are funds allocated to individual contractors who are out there doing, you know, some kind of. In other words, the excess, because there's no there's no list of okay, here's every here's all the contractors and here's their maximum financial obligation under the contract for this particular year. Um, and in going through the encumbered amounts, there appeared to be funds that were encumbered for projects that may have already been completed or, um, you know, so it, it's just, it's not entirely clear that these are all allocated to current available contractors. And so I guess my thought on this was more to redirect these funds from, you know, just uh, something that might have been planned in 2017 or 2016 to current services. Um, you know, on this one, let me just say, I, I would have a different recommendation. And let, let me say what it is based just on this discussion. 
I do think that um, procurement should make available to you for review the contracts um, in behavioral health to better understand what are embedded in contracts, you know, versus what isn't just being utilized by the department. And that would make me more comfortable because I think the fact that that, that isn't clear means that it, that's a very high risk um, enterprise for us to remove funds without knowing that. But what I'd like to, um, through the direction that we make is ask uh, procurement to make that information available to you so that you can take a look at that before we would take any action in this area. Supervisor, those contracts are managed through the department and the list does exist and the maximum financial obligations do exist. So we'll get the list to um, RB Rose. And that would be great. The reason I was asking about procurement is I know that we've been looking for that one giant list in the sky that we're supposed to have one place we can access all contracts throughout the county. And I, if what you're telling me is we're not there yet, and then it'll go to behavioral health, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Um, I want to go to item nine now, and this is the advertising and professional fees. I think Dr. Smith here is what I would really like to just um, request is that, um, that this actually be invested over the next year and that we see a plan that comes back through health and hospital on the investment strategy of that resource. Right, I think uh, we can certainly give you a plan. Um, this is a response to the board's avid desire to improve our marketing for BMC, particularly doing during the COVID crisis. And so we will give you a more explicit plan of where that money is anticipated to be paid or spent. And then, and then the, the other follow-up is as part of the budget process, when we listen to this in the next spring, this should actually be pulled out to, to because this has been board direction for many, 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 many years. And the amount spent doesn't look like it's really being heated. Now, I, I understand there are a lot of complications to that, but, but we we're well past that now with two additional hospitals. That's a really small amount to spend given the size of the enterprise. Um, so am I understanding that in July, you'd like to see the number bigger? No, I guess what I'm saying is I just want to make sure it got invested. You know, oh, okay. I don't want it buried in the budget. I want them to be able to come and say, nope, we did it. Here's what our plan looked like. It was great. And, you know, yeah. and that, that's all. I just I think, get it. Yeah. I get it. I get Thank it. Um, and then to go back, um, I want to go to item five, and this is the general fund transfers for the capital out, outlay. On this item, you know, there's actually a very good list on packet page 38 of the, the um, areas that are being focused on by the auditors. And it includes the medical respite center, a warehouse improvements, jail project improvements, and the TB refugee clinic. This is not wholesale. Uh, it doesn't appear to me to be a, um, you know, an, an attack on the VASC or any of the other projects that are being um, discussed. But here's what I wanna recommend on this one. I, I do think that a better, a stronger understanding um, of where these projects are in process and um, what the uh, appropriate allocation should be is, is really worthy of, frankly, um, I'll say this to you, Otto, is really worthy of a deeper discussion by this committee. And I think one challenge here is that um, when I was reading, uh, you know, Cheryl, um, your team did a really nice job of just laying out the perspective on why we were where we were and how we draw down resources. It does appear to me that the, the overall um, capital investment strategy countywide is something that's it's really always in flux. And, you know, understanding um, how and why we are moving on particular projects is I think pretty critical for us all to understand, I think in particular because as part, I hope as part of the um, uh, art money and other one-time investments that we have, that we're gonna have an opportunity to be opportunistic, both in terms of what we purchase and what we build based on immediate needs or emerging trends. And 
uh, and I recognize by having some resources in this pool, it does give you that flexibility. But I think what it lacks is a little bit of clarity. I don't even want to say transparency. I think it's a, a I mean, it's transparency in its broadest sense, but I think it has more to do with clarity in terms of the, the number of um, projects that FAF has at any, any given time, which I just think is complex and, and difficult to, to always understand. So on this one, what I really appreciated, Cheryl, about your staff taking a look at these is that there does appear to be some inconsistencies in terms of uh, planning, investment, and staging of resources in this particular fund. And so what I would want to recommend is that that the um, that in partnership with fleets and facilities that that as part when the um, I know you do an annual report on our capital outlay that there is much more clarity about um, how these funds are being used and when we're when we are being what, what the staging looks like in terms of what's our normal staging for how we make investments over what period of time and then a little bit more information just about the um, project timelines and investment strategies, because I, these would have stood out to me too, um, just reading through these for, for various reasons. And some of it, some of them even related to each other are inconsistent. So to be clear, when we look at the capital budget um, next year, it should include the framework for staging investments the justification for keeping something in the pipeline if it's not moving, and opportunities that we see emerging uh, in emerging trends or immediate needs where we need a more opportunistic fund. My understanding is that those funds sit in, not in necessarily in this fund, but they're funds that fund this fund. So this would include taking a look at this fund and the as a capital outlay fund, but the other funds that feed into this fund to better understand what the available resources are. Because I think Dr. Smith, your point, your very important point about the significant changes in cost to the um, to the psychiatric center, that, that $100 million differential is so significant and it's, it's all one-time money and you don't wanna disrupt ongoing services for one-time investment. So having some flexibility in these funds is, is probably very helpful. But the lack of clarity would it makes it difficult for me um, as one member of the board to review these and say, oh, maybe we have a little bit more give here. And in the case of an emergency or an emerging project, does it make sense for revenue and resources to be able to come from here or from another part of the budget? Yeah, let me uh, respond a little bit. Um, what we try to do to be transparent about projects is the 10-year capital plan, which the board approves, um, and um, the creation of a um, fund for um, replacement, you know, based uh, dep depreciation fund for replacement for other capital expenditures. So, you know, like any business would do, if you have a building that you know has a 30 year life expectancy, if you wait until the 30 years is up to try to come up with the one-time funds, you um, are in a much worse position than you do if you keep a depreciation fund. But I hear what you're saying is that um, you would like the 10 year um, project plan, um, capital project plan to be more explicit about the timing, and we can do that by doing a modified GAN chart for at least the big projects so that you would see what's planned operationally at what time and um, what investment it would take at particular times within a realm of, you know, not absolute certainty because obviously things are plus or minus. Uh, changes occur, you know, as you know, we had changes in the Basque layout at the last minute, which caused extra money to be spent. So we do need to realize that if we do a GAN chart with the 10-year capital improvement plan, that there is some flexibility that is required. So we'll make it more clear next year about exactly 
what um, is anticipated in the projects. Yeah, and I just will say too that I know there's, I wanna be mindful that we don't give the impression to anybody who's building for us that there's there's a slush fund for them to you know, come after, um, which I do think is also a challenge for the public sector, right? In terms of how we, how we budget. But I do really appreciate, uh, Dr. Smith, the point you're raising about the, the um, need for that fund to have, you know, to have enough certainty and flexibility and be able to manage both parts. And I think that the other thing I would just say is as part of the 10 year capital plan, I think it should just reflect um, all the all of the inputs, not just the, the major fund. And I really appreciate your point about the depreciation fund. I, I think you're right that part of having a healthy, clean, you know, safe um, work, you know, uh, environment for our employees is really being assertive about how we're reinvesting. So all of that is very appreciated. And yeah, I love the idea of a mon modified Gantt chart. I think that would make it easier for us to see where things are and frankly how we how we frame up the investment strategies is going to be really helpful thank you um the only other one that i wanted to to um to better address it or be better understand um just from this discussion dr smith is based on the feedback that cheryl gave on the funding of vacant positions I wonder if, and, and also I appreciate that you found 5 million that, that could be um, put into the savings pot, but I'm wondering if you could give a little more feedback to why you're, di you're discomforted by the, the 10 million. A um, couple of things, um, funding for um, different positions has a mixture of different funding sources. And so what this represents is $10 million of allocated funds from the board uh, from various funding sources. It doesn't all come from the general fund. And it's in order to ca cause us to be able to hire positions. So um, we, if we're anxious to speed up the hiring process, uh, we don't feel like we should create a system where we have to keep coming back to the board and taking money away from other sources. Now, of course, this is really just a judgment call. As Cheryl pointed out, um, they just picked half of what was available in fund balance last year. Um, that, you know, you could be a quarter, you could be a half, you could be 60%, you could be 40%. I think this will be a subject that's constantly debated because every year it's, there's different priorities for hiring, different priorities for vacant positions. So um, it's really a judgment call, I think. And through the chair, and this is Greg if I if I may add to uh, to that, you know, the, the budget already includes a calculated budget reduction factor for vacancies that's attributed to, to normal attrition. But you know, any additional savings from extraordinary vacancy levels is uh, needed to pay overtime and extra help cost to staff public service posts uh, during the recruitment period to fill regular posts. And one of the service concerns that we have is that we don't want our services to be impacted you know, uh, during those, those periods of recruitment, and you know, need, needlessly, you know, um, you know, reduce service levels. So there is that factor, um, and the intention is to ensure that posts are covered and services are provided uh, to our community, and and also just to add that even i know it's only one month but taking a look at the july spend so far we've spent 158.9 million just in, in, in the general fund uh for salaries and benefits and you know we're on trend to spend we believe the amount that's been appropriated appropriated for salaries and benefits so i know this is early stage it's only one month but given where we're at we would be concerned about 
further reducing the budget for our salaries and benefits until we got at least more experience, perhaps at mid-year. Uh, we always take a, a close look at our mid-year process and we would, you know, of course, continue to take a close look to see if there is uh, any change in that trend. I thought this was, um, and Cheryl, maybe I could ask you this. I, I, I'm sorry that reading the report, I thought this was general fund dollars. It, it is general fund dollars and it does take into account, we try to back out any an estimate for overtime and extra help um, because we know that some of the funds that are um, not expended because the position is vacant will in fact be used for, you know, to continue to provide some level of service through overtime and extra help. So we do estimate that as part of our, you know, due diligence of trying to come to, you know, some kind of reasonable estimate of what's actually not going to be expended. Um, so that is taken into account. And these are, you know, general fund positions. And okay. through the chair, if, if I may add, though, when we say general fund, maybe this is the, uh, the fiscal person in me. I know most of the revenues in the general fund are restricted in nature. You know, only only the you know, property tax, some small part of the sales tax is, is discretionary. So uh, when we sometimes when we say general fund, what we mean is the discretionary portion of the general fund. And so while this is the, this is the, we're talking about the general fund, a lot of the quote unquote un savings, if you want to call it unspent amounts is, is backed by restricted uh, revenues. And we also receive or can use less of those restricted revenues. So this doesn't represent the net savings of a discretionary dollars. I'm getting a little, a little bit nerdy here. <laughs> I can't help it, but uh, be a little nitpicky, but just to provide some clarification, you know, on what we meet uh, by the, the net cost. I should have been clear, not restricted general fund or limited general fund. Some general fund, it's general fund, but it has to be spent in certain ways or the board has already made commitments to expand the services in certain ways. So um, thank you. And um, Supervisor Lee, thank you for letting me jump into this because I am, I, um, I'd love to get your feedback before I make some recommendations on next steps. Sure, thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Um, so first of all, I just wanna highlight the, uh, the one that I think uh, that staff agreed on is the item number five, where we came up with about 5.86 or $5.9 million of savings. And that's something um, uh, that that uh, would definitely be available to be saved, which is which is good. Um, as for the very first item, the explanation, Chair, the way I understood it is the 10 million, basically just half of the 20 surplus of previous years. Uh, so, and then Dr. Smith was saying that hey, it could be half, it could be 25 percent, but no, it really depends on how you want to spin this, but at the end of the day, really is we have to look at the savings too from grade so that given July looks like we're in line of where the saving is, we probably shouldn't mess with it right now. Look for it a few more months, right? And then maybe at mid-year, we could do that adjustment. Am I correct, Greg? Is that what you're saying about one? Yes, that, that's what I'm suggesting is that we'd like to have more than one month of, of actual spend for this fiscal year uh, before we would revise our projections for what's going to actually be spent this fiscal year. And typically we take that deep dive, the deep analysis in our mid-year review. And at that point, we've got six months of actual data to, to study, as well as the actual revenue offsets that a lot of these salaries and benefits have a, a revenue offset. And we want to be able to consider that as well. Right. And in terms of just the general budgeting concept, right, we are very different, for example, say the federal government. One thing I know the federal government does is if you don't spend the money by the end of fiscal year, which would be September 30th, any type of surplus is looked at very negatively so that in the year, next year, uh, that might be shafted. And I certainly don't believe that's a way to, to, to practice budgeting. 
So in the case that we show that there's been surplus in general from last year, to me it's not that thing because that's the money that will go back to the general fund or wherever the expected fund amount is. So um, I, I'm just so in general as a concept, uh, my way of understanding budget is that given the way that we are not going to, I don't want to punish uh, funds not being spent because of the fact that we generally want to say, generally we're concerned, uh, for example, like behavior health, that the amount has been increasing from 1718 from 35 million all the way to 2123 to 72 million, right? So we really have a huge need for, for mental health uh, services, behavior health services, and, and of all the programs we're coming up with, we have approved ALD the last meeting. Uh, I certainly want to make sure that the funding is available for the expansion. Uh, so in those situations when the money is not being spent, I'm very concerned because that means services that needs to be provided to the community has not happened. Yet at the same time, I would say for the other areas where the money is not being spent, um, at the end of the year, it might not necessarily be a bad thing. So that's, that's my two cents on that. Um, Is there anything else, uh, Greg, you want to discuss about what I just talked about regarding these numbers? No, I don't, I don't think so. But maybe just to echo your point that all the revenues get expended and used on public services. And, and even if in any of these cases, uh, because projects get delayed, um, don't get started late, that doesn't mean that the money doesn't get put to use. If something doesn't get uh, completed this fiscal year, then we, we obviously as staff complete your direction the following fiscal year. And we track all of this right. and, and we'll come back in, even in September and recognize them. much of what these numbers are based off of is, is last year's gap between budget and expense. We're going to ask the board to reappropriate those same things to get that good work right. done. And so I, and maybe that's just another way to echo uh, your, your point from using my terminology. Right, that, that if they were somehow over budgeted, right, and that surplus, but the money doesn't go away, right? The money's still there, it's just that you appropriate them this year instead. Correct. That's, that's, that's always been. So uh, leaving it there, it gives you the flexibility to, to, come, to execute this year if, if it turns out we could do it this year, right? So, okay, I get that. Okay, all right. Um, Dr. Smith, uh, am I capturing what you're saying, or is there? or then mis misinterpret what, what you were saying regarding flexibility. Yes, I think you captured it. I think the important issue to remember is that budgeting in the governmental situation based on state regulations and general accounting principles is a projection. Mm -hmm. And the projections based on our best um, guess of what the expenditure is going to be and what the revenues are going to be. And so when we recommend a budget to the board, we're not basing it upon last year's accounting necessarily. We're basing it on our projection of what the expenditures are gonna be involving many factors. Um, and you know, by definition, um, we don't hit it exactly, um, but we do pretty close out of $9 billion our general fund um, fund balance is typically very small. And I'll also point out that from a standpoint of financial assessment, when the rating agencies look at our books and look at our budgeting, if they see a very slim um, fund balance, they get very concerned and that causes problems with our ratings because what they, they perceive that as um, not having enough uh, flexibility in the budget to be able to deal with unexpected eventualities. Um, so it is a balancing technique. Yes, Dr. Smith, I think I could use the analogy of how people get their credit score, right? So you have a tons of credit cards, a huge amount of credit that's not being used that's how you get a good credit score. <laughs> and if you get too close to your uh, your maximum amount, then your credit score would plunge because they thought you had no cushion left, something like that. Yeah, they always want to make sure that um, if they're going to rate us highly and people are going to buy bonds, municipal bonds, they want to be 100% sure that those bonds are going to be paid off 
and they realize that there are other eventualities and operations that have high priority. So um, a very small fund balance at the end of a year is a problem from the rating agency perspective. Now we don't obviously want it to be high, but we want it to be, you know, Goldilocks approach just right. If, if I if I could, through the chair, I just would like to say that none of these recommendations would damage the county's credit rating. And so I just I just feel like I need to put that on the record. And what I would say also is that you know this is last year's mm -hmm. excess money that the board appropriated for services. Those services were not delivered. So if you want those services to be delivered, there needs to be a reassessment of what the monies are for. And yes, our recommendations are very conservative in order to make sure that we are not damaging any actual services. But these, these are funds that were appropriated by the board that were not used. And while, you know, a fund balance is great, our purpose is to provide this accounting to the board so that they can see if they would like to appropriate these funds for actual services that they're available. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for that. I mean, 280 million on spend is not a small chunk of change. Uh, and, and I, I certainly take your uh, point, especially this year with all the COVID issues that we've gone through in terms of administering this out there. Uh, so that's, uh, thank, thank you for, for that. Uh, Silva, okay, Silva is a shovel. Yeah, go ahead. I saw your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other point, and that is that. You know, as part of our budgeting process every year, I, I believe that the board um, in partnership with the staff has done a, a really good job of making sure that we have um, funds available, both in the, in the case of an emergency and rainy day funds. And the, the reason I point that out is that I, I don't know, and I, I'll look, go back and look at our rating agency um, memos that have come before us. I, I think that a big part of the the way we keep ourselves um, in a high rating is making sure that we keep those funds available in in the appropriate fund, um, uh, you know, in the appropriate funds. And you know, and frankly, we try to budget our ending fund balance even using our our policies. So I say that because I I think that. You know, I think this is a really important discussion and I'm glad we had it because I think it it's going to help all of us better understand what I think will become more choppy waters in the future relative to to our overall um, standing. So, you know, anyway, I, I wanted to also say that and and um, Supervisor Lee, if you're done with your comments, I am prepared to make a motion if you're ready for that. Yes, please. So, please proceed. Yeah, thank you. What I wanted to move is um, that item one be yeah, come back for a reassessment in mid-year and that that reassessment be done um, between the Office of Budget Analysis and our management, um, our auditing team, because I, I think having two agenda items reflects that we didn't, that our staffs didn't talk. And I, I think that the that, that, that pardon me, that that's very important that that come back as one item, even if it's not in total agreement. Um, second, that item eight, the that we do not um, leave the contract services, but that the board is notified when Harvey Rose receives the information from the um, department to better understand how much money has been allocated and, and what the actual lack of encumbrance really, really is relative to those contracts. That item nine um, comes that we have an off agenda with the plan and an investment strategy and that there's a specific report out on that investment strategy um, that we accept um, item five that where there was agreement 
and that I would like to recommend that the smaller items uh, that were on the um, board, that those come back to the board with, um, and uh, Greg, if you and Cheryl could talk one more time to see if there's any other areas of agreement and those areas that remain in disagreement be highlighted for the board when this come back to the board um, in September. Okay. That would be my motion. I'll second it. Was that clear enough for Cheryl, for you and Greg and Dr. Smith? Yes. Yes. Thank you. We do have a request to speak. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's open a public hearing. All right. The next speaker, speaker is Alyssa Koff Ginsburg. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Oh, she has uh, lowered her hand. That uh, concludes our request to speak. <laughs> oh, now she's back. Uh, Alyssa, you will have two minutes to speak. And the timer will start when you begin, when you begin speaking. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Elisa Kofkinsborg with the Behavioral Health Contractors Association. Um, I want to thank Dr. Smith for his thoughtful description of the current circumstances that we're facing in behavioral health. Uh, as you know, we've shared a number of recommendations, everything from um, ch making changes to access so it is easier for those most vulnerable to receive services to flexibility and how programs are structured, to um, ways to stabilize our workforce in order to increase the number of clients that are served, which would be reflected in the amount of money spent. We've seen a huge growth in job opportunities in this area. There was a great workforce shortage pre-COVID and it has only gotten worse. One provider shared with me that they were using a, um, a consultant to try to find staff, and they were told there are 600 open positions within 25 miles of their office here in San Jose. What we're seeing on the positive side is that more people are going for help and, and more help is being provided. But that means that Kaiser hospitals, employers, and some school districts have significantly increased the compensation that they offer. We have not been able to adjust our rates. To become competitive again, we need to be able to adjust rates, increase what we can offer, or we'll see a big divide between those who have access to behavioral health services and those who are relying on the safety net and cannot gain them. Thank you. And our next speaker, Urvish Kumar Metka, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to uh, the Board of Supervisors, uh, as well as uh, uh, the city staff uh, for the presentation. I wanted to specifically emphasize on the governance and the finance operation committee about the budgeting, uh, as well as uh, the adjusted, uh, the audited, adjusted, and the administrative net uh, budget that is being uh, finalized for uh, for the County of Santa Clara's budget. When any budget that is supposed to be required to be sanctioned or uh, being, uh, being commissioned, it is important that it has to be a futuristic, based upon the futuristic needs, as well as the expansion of the County of Santa Clara's jurisdiction in terms of a public governance and the development of a policy. At this particular point, the County of Santa Clara is going through the redistricting process. In terms of a redistricting, the expansion would be in terms of a hiring as well as, as, well as enhancing the justice juvenile system, as well as making sure about that the County of Santa Clara are able to implement the assembly and the Senate bill as part of a new governance policies, making sure about that the needs from the management's perspective, as well as the council's perspective and the executive perspective from the County of Santa Clara's entire committees 
being able to serve to the county of Santa Clara staff as well as the council and also to ensure that that it is able to study the needs of a staff as well as not to forget the sheriff's department because the budget expansion that widespread through the multiple divisions and the needs of that budget does expand based upon the nonprofit organization's participation and the federal grant as well as state grants that is being awarded. So certainly put that into consideration. There are a lot many improvements that can be made. Thank you very much. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Um, if there's no more speaker, I'll go ahead and take the vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Chairperson Lee? Yes. Oh, okay. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So the motion carries uh, unanimously, and uh, this will be brought back to the board. Okay. Um, let's see. Next item, I think we are skipping to, give me a second. It's number eight. Am I correct? Yes. So have item number eight, which is uh, to receive the fiscal year 2021 2022. Audit work plan for the Office of the County Exec Internal Audit Division. Here to present this item on behalf of the administration is Robin Rose and staff. Robin, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, supervisors. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for being here. Please proceed. Yes, um, can you see my screen okay? Yes, very colorful. Oh, thank you. And I have three screens, so I'm not sure if you see the one that's my side or if it's the one with the full screen. I see two two screens actually. I see the uh, colorful slide. Yep, there we go. So that's all. No problem. No, because I'm trying to move it. See how I can move it over to this other side. So my apologies. Just bear with me. One second. It also shows the next slide of what it's doing. Okay. Well, I guess it'll still work. Okay. So currently, we see your main slide, and we see yeah, the main slide, okay. and also the next slide on the right. Uh -huh. No problem. So I'm here to present the Internal Audit Division's fiscal year 21-22 budget, which I'm happy to present. Um, just to give a little background, um, Internal Audit was previously under the Controller Treasurer's Department, and we recently moved. Uh, we moved to the County Executive's Office effective July 1st. Um, 2021. Oh, thank you. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I hope you move it. <laughs> and so we um, we have from the results of an external quality review by the Institute of Internal Auditors, they recommended that we expand our um, our risk assessment process, as well as recommended us to move to a higher level authority within the county. So that's what warranted the move to ensure that we remain independent and objective among other county departments when evaluating um, the efficiency and effectiveness of county operations because you know our mission is to add value by helping the management achieve their goals and objectives and to ensure that internal controls are operating as designed and plus increases our visibility among county departments so that way we have greater exposure and will be the first line of defense whenever they have any issues related to risk affecting their county uh, departments and operations. And um, we're required to do a comprehensive risk assessment, which we have presented to you today. So that way we can address the most vulnerable and significant risks facing the county. And so our methodology, um, Harvey Rose, um, Cheryl was very gracious to provide their, their risk assessment process. And it kind of coincided with us wanting to do more comprehensive at the departmental and program functional level. So we use, uh, we analyzed SAP and use the same 1,530 cost centers to develop our risk assessment, as well as review the recommended budget book for the current fiscal year, gather other financial data and SAP, send a questionnaire to all county departments asking department management to provide information us at their department and functional levels to see what, what risks are facing their county, especially during COVID times when you know the county was faced with severe budget cuts, um, challenges to meet Demand, increased risk demands, and also work remotely. Um, we looked at results of prior audits done either by external auditors um, through Harvey Rose, an outside agency, a grantor, and applied um, different factors um, at a high, medium, or low risk. And based on that, 
and we developed what determined what our audit client did and our limit to fees. And just at a high level, um, the results, we had 347 high risk cost takers among the 32 county agencies and we selected audits among 19 of the 13 departments and agencies. And on the left, these are the factors that we considered from looking at the compliance requirements, concerns from finance agency, as well as county executive management. So we can look at the fiscal as well as the high level management operations, um, any departmental requests from the results of the survey, the time since last audit internally or externally, um, the changes in turnover and management, which has happened uh, over the last several years, especially recently with the, um, the visa program and a lot of uh, management wanting to retire, and as well as any susceptibility to fraud, such as um, cash or, you know, and gift cards, things of that nature, uh, new or eliminating programs or functions, such as, you know, the housing program and assistance provided during the pandemic, uh, looking at other expenditures, services and, and supplies, because we already know with the executive management as well as other key management that um, payroll is always going to be changing, but we want to look at the services and supplies to see where the fluctuations were there, and as well as the increase in funding, because we received several uh, million dollars of grant money from the federal and state sources, and any other departments rely on the activity. And based on that, this is kind of a snapshot of what we decided um, were the audits. We have nine audits that were mandated and ongoing, 15 that were high risk, 14 requests from departments as a result of our survey, and 14 other potential audits. So based on all these audits, the total auditable hours are about 16,000, but we only have a projected resources of about 12,400. So the gap will either be carried over audits to the next fiscal year, or we can outsource to outside agencies. Any questions? Okay, Robin. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, and uh, uh, for the presentation. So, first of all, I want to thank you and your team's uh, diligence on this uh, odd work plan. I am mindful of the fact that COVID-19 has certainly disrupted our county's operations in the most unprecedented way, making people work in so many different areas to all help out the COVID effort. And I understand that you've identified a total of 347 high-risk uh, cost centers. Correct. The current work plan only includes 19 of the 32 high risk departments due to the staffing limitations. Um, and certainly it's important to, that we prioritize covering these all these 32 departments. Um, I'm, I'm just want to know, uh, has this happened before in the past? And uh, in situations like this, um, does the county typically uh, move people around to do the work? We'll outsource this work to somebody else to do the audit. Maybe I can jump in on that, um, Robin. Um, maybe a little context for the public, uh, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, Robin and, and her group um, are internal audit, and uh, Harvey Rose is external audit. And the reason we have that function is because many of the <clears throat> issues that need attention are of the sort that Harvey Rose either doesn't do um, in, in because they don't get the direction from the board or they're more uh, operational. For example, um, the mandated audits where we have to do um, things based on the revenue that we receive, um, say social services, where you have to make sure that the money is actually spent on a particular issue or um, every time we transition an office of an executive, we have to audit that. And then as Robin mentioned, there are cash audits. The hospital has an audit function in terms of quality assurance, which is not under um, Robin, but coordinates with her. IT has an audit process for security, um, number of other operational audits where they're looking at required or necessary reviews for, with outside eyes 
on a particular function. Um, that's different than external audit, Harvey Rose. And um, the internal audit division has existed for a long time, forever, basically. Um, it's not been typical that we have so much that needs to be done um, so that we consider bringing in additional resources. But as you point out, um, COVID really put a lot of stress on it. And, you know, we're going to have audits of all of our FEMA expenditures, ARP expenditures, any other expenditures through the hospital that come with a lot of regulations attached. So we probably will need to expand capacity for internal audit to make sure we don't um, get audited from the outside and get surprised by something. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. So Dr. Smith, you're basically saying that you believe you will be uh, looking to hire more folks internally to help audit? Yes, I think so, because um, <clears throat> the types of audits that are required for FEMA and for the st uh, state and federal relief uh, funds that we're going to be getting, ARP and, you know, CalAIM and all that, they're real-time audits. Um, where they have to be done on a regular basis. They're not audits that can wait till the end of the year. And so there is time urgency about it. And if we don't do them correctly, we get into trouble. Plus we have, um, you know, we know that FEMA and others will do their own external audits after we've expended the money um, and oftentimes those audits will take 10 years before they're finished and they require a lot of cooperation with our internal audit team in order to make sure that um, everybody gets the right information. And we expect that in the hospital as well as related to the COVID expenditures. So there's going to be a need for a lot of people to be reviewing um, real-time expenditures and revenues. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah, I've uh, learned the same thing about these uh, type of uh, funds. Uh, all these funds, FEMA, uh, relief funds, ARP, certainly there's uh, strings attached, right? It's not uh, money that they just give to you. The auditing function is it's significant. And for FEMA, it takes, what, years? I've heard like even three, four years plus to get it resolved. So uh, certainly we want to make sure that we have all the documentation. Last thing we want is because of the lack of that or some delay, we our, our funding request. So that we spend this rejection, we get called back, right? So I think uh, that certainly is, is, is very important to make sure that we are spending our funds uh, diligently and quickly and not past the deadline. So thank you for that. Oh, um, sorry, I uh, forgot to ask uh, Supervisor Chavez, do you have any uh, comments on this? Oh, I um, Otto, thank you so much for um, pulling this off consent. I just had one, I, I had two big kind of big questions. One is Dr. Smith, um, does it make sense just from an, a speed perspective based on what you just said that we both seek to bring um, on staff, but also that we do look for external contracts, particularly just given the expertise of the, the really particular expertise you're talking about uh, for example, relative to FEMA? Yes, actually, we've already hired a FEMA expert, um, but I think we will need some more external support. Um, so you're absolutely right on. We probably will need some special expertise, which we'll have to uh, get with uh, contract workers. I mean, we we have great employees that do a great job, but there, there's not always the expertise with FEMA and other functions that we need right away. Well, and I, I'm particularly interested in that given the, the um, level of need relative to our healthcare system overall. I mean, like you're right, there's probably specialists too to even understand hospital accounting and all that. Um, but what I'm curious about is when will, when will the additional positions and the additional out, 
the uh, additional uh, contract assistance um, come before the board. This is Robin, I can iterate that two positions were already presented for the recommended budget cycle that we're in the process of recruiting for. So internal audit currently has nine positions, which includes myself, the internal audit manager, the supervising internal auditor, and seven um, staff positions. And one of those staff positions is vacant. So we'll have three recruitments that we're working with ESA and HR. I guess um, I, what I would be interested in is if, as part of the September discussion on the budget, if you could just highlight if there are additional positions needed and uh, yeah. that would we'll, be great. We'll need additional positions. Uh, as Robin said, there's only nine and uh, there's a lot of work to do. Plus, I think we'll need uh, additional outside contracts. Um, so we'll try to highlight that for you in September. That'd be great. And I and I just wanted to really um, lift up the, the control issue relative to the pandemic because I, I recognize, you know, this is all brand new work for us. And so the sooner we can get in and make sure that that we're, we're just really mastering it, the better. So I really, I appreciate that. Thank you. And then my only last question is, um, Dr. Smith, since this is now in your in your office, which makes a ton of sense to me, does this office report directly to you or is it something that reports to the COO? Well, for years it reported to the director of finance and was actually in the finance department. And we had an external audit <laughs> review from a uh, agency that um, reviews the structures and function of internal audit um, agencies in multiple governmental structures. And they recommended that it report directly to the CEO. Um, but as an important part of that function, they have to report out issues to the board. And so they will technically report to me from an administrative perspective, but they will also share um, outcomes and issues with the board. Directly. And would that be done annually now? Um, we're going to actually do it uh, more than annually, but uh, we don't have a exact date. Um, we're coming up with a schedule. It'll, it'll be through FGOC. I think it'll be quarterly. Got it, quarterly. That's great. That's helpful. Thank you. Don't hold me to that because well, I know uh, it's, it's a new it's a new way of doing it. I was I was actually really intrigued with the report. It was very informative. Thank you. Yeah. And I would do a receipt of the report. Oh, yeah, I'll second it and I'll go ahead. Uh, is any uh, public would like to speak on this? There are no requests to speak. All right. We'll go ahead and post the public hearing. And do I? Well, we already have moved and seconded. Uh, let's go take the vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Yes, then, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. We have a unanimous vote. And moving on to the next item, I believe uh, should be item 11. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 11 is to receive a report from the Office of the Sheriff relating to creating positions. Here to present this item, I believe, has uh, Sheriff Smith or your staff this year. Good afternoon, Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Chavez. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you fine. Thank you. I'm Captain Kirkland, the main jail facility commander. With me is Captain Duran, support services commander, and Captain Pageant, Elmwood commander. Slide two. This report is regarding the newly created positions, especially those created to comply with the consent that are backfilled using overtime. This was requested by Supervisor Lee during June 14, 2021 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. I just wanted to say, if you have slides, we, we can't see them. Okay, we'll, we'll get them up there right now. Okay, just find you now. 
there in the bottom in the bottom panel. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, slide three is going to show the office of the sheriff is allocated a set number of positions each year during the budget process. This graph, which will be shown shortly, has the total number of positions, both sworn and non-sworn, allocated during the past five fiscal years. As you can see, the number of positions within the office of the sheriff and the Department of Corrections has been on the decline over the past five years, despite increasing demand and expectations on staff. Prior to the start of COVID-19, our deputies were faced with increasing demands on training and duties as a result of the remedial plans associated with the consent decrees and from recommendations from the Board of Supervisors. Since the start of COVID-19, our deputies have been tasked with additional duties to protect inmates, visit, visit, I'm sorry, visitors, staff, and the community. To meet these vast demands, new roles have been established. Overtime has been used to pay for these positions. The following slides outline these positions. Slide four. Are you guys able to see the slides? Can you see the slide? Yes, and yes, we're on slide correct. four. We're yes. okay. Yeah, thank you. This slide shows positions currently in operation. The top list identifies those which are created to cope to COVID or fulfills other needs. The COVID investigation unit is in our contract tracing unit for the agency. It began in March of 2020 in response to COVID-19. It is a vital program that supports the safety of inmates, visitors, staff, and the community. The video arraignment program is a system through which inmates can attend their arraignment hearings virtually. It is stationed in the Elmwood Correctional Facility. It began shortly after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. It supports the safety of inmates, court staff, custody staff, and the attorneys by reducing exposure contact that takes place during in-person participation in court hearings proceedings. This program requires five employees to operate. Let's go to slide five. Good afternoon, Supervisor Strong and Supervisor Lee. Uh, my name is Captain Mark Patrick at the Elmwood facility. Um, I'll go through a few of our roles that we've been filling with over time to break down. Excuse me, do you mind uh, speaking a little bit closer to the mic, please? I'm sorry, I could not hear you that well. Thank you. Is that a little better? Yeah, a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to break down some positions at Elmwood that we're filling. Uh, we currently have to utilize over time to fill. Uh, they're based on uh, remedial plan, access to care, uh, things of that nature. We are on slide five. There you go. Next. So dental uh, position. All of the inmates have access to dental care. The remedial plan from the Chavez consent decree expands access for inmates to more routine dental care procedures. For example, inmates in custody for more than a year are able to request to have a dental exam. They have access to dental exams every year as long as they remain in custody. The increased access to dental services requires additional staffing to ensure that inmates can be taken to their scheduled dental appointments uh, to remain in compliance. Uh, appointments cannot be accommodated without sufficient supervision. Uh, Elmwood and Women's Facility uh, utilize two full-time deputies to serve as dental rovers to uh, pick up, supervise, and work with the dental staff at Elmwood. Uh, the hospital position is for uh, four positions we currently utilize, and that is directly related to access to care. Um, in similar fashion, there's always been a need to transport inmates for health related reasons to outside hospitals or clinics, uh, such as uh, specialized clinic medical care. However, re remedial plan from both the Chavez uh, consent decree and the Cole consent decree uh, have increased access requirements to specialized care. 
The hospital drugs are needed for the transportation and supervision of inmates while outside of the facility. Uh, the M1 positions, uh, M1 is a building that we started occupying several years ago when we went through remedial plan uh, construction. It's used as swing space when we close down units. We will uh, move that population to M1. Also with the uh, COVID pandemic, we used it for COVID housing. Um, it's a, a medical type of a, uh, a building. It has uh, negative air rooms and things like that to where we can put uh, individuals who are COVID positive or um, undergoing some type of uh, COVID test due to being symptomatic. Uh, it houses numerous security levels due to its operational design. It requires more staffing than normal housing units. Um, we covered the swing space and due to the large number of construction plans that we have going on currently, the main jail has the infirmary closed for uh, ADA upgrades and all of the infirmary population is currently housed at Elmwood. W4 and W4C positions at the women's facility are directly related to additional staffing uh, requirements to comply with out of cell activity due to the remedial plan. Both of these units house um, se severely mentally ill population and the increased time in working with custody health to get structured program um, facilitated for that population. M8. Uh, D and M8H and M8 movements. Uh, the additional staffing is directly related to the building of M8. It's required to assist in providing access to medical care, metal, metal, uh, mental health services, while, and also while maintaining facility security of the building. Uh, staff are also needed to assist the module duties to allow for increased program time. They are both required by remedial plans, as we know. In addition, these staff escorts and supervise inmates to interviews and other visits. The main jail has the same needs for dental rovers and hospital guards as Elmwood and CCW. Unit 2B serves as an overflow housing for both seriously mentally ill inmates and COVID-19 patients. Compliance with the remedial plan requires additional staffing to ensure the safety of medical and mental health staff as they meet their needs of these patients and the requirements for out-of-cell activities. 4C3 houses inmates who are seriously mentally ill. So the additional staffing is used in a similar fashion. This is an indirect supervision module. So there is an additional task of applying restraints and escorting all inmates to the sun deck to ensure compliance with the out of cell activity requirements of the remedial plan. Excuse me, um, are you still on slide number five? This is slide number six. Six, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, would you somebody want to move it to six, please? It is on six, sir. Ours, ours I'm looking at five, I'm sorry. Okay. Let's try again. Here's Elmwood. Should say main jail at the top? No, it still it says Elmwood. Elmwood, yeah. Okay. Let's <clears throat> Does it say main jail now, sir? Um, unfortunately, no. Still same same slide. Okay. Oh. Did it? I thought it did, but it went away really fast. So sorry. No. no. <laughs> okay. We'll try one more time here and then. Sure, sure, sure. There you go. Ah, there you go. Okay, so um, yes. we discussed uh, that main jail has the same needs for the dental rover yes. and hospital guards. Uh, we discussed 2B, which serves for overflow for the mentally ill and COVID-19 patients. 4C housing is also for seriously mentally ill and requires um, the applying of restraints for escorting these inmates to their uh, 
programs. Um, now on to 7B and 7C. Each requires additional staff members to ensure compliance with the increased out of cell activity and program time required by the remedial plan and to maintain the safety and security of the facility. The 8A units require additional staff to ensure compliance with the increased out of cell activity and program requirements by the remedial plan. In addition, the staff provide for the safety and security of the facility, which allows custody health service to attend to the high medical and mental health needs of these inmates. This is our mental health housing unit, A. Yeah. Good afternoon, this is Captain Thomas Duran. In regards to the ADA Compliance Unit, the ADA Compliance Unit meets the ADA needs of inmates in both facilities. The demands on the ADA Compliance Unit staff are very high. Their work is covered by the remedial plans from both consent decrees. Uh, they have additional ADA certification and or training and serve many roles. Regularly interviewing inmates, training inmate unit staff, working with medical staff, investigating complaints and connecting with plaintiff's counsel. In order to meet the various needs, one additional full-time employee has been added to the ADA compliance unit. And that concludes our presentation and we're available for any questions we have any. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, do you have any questions on this item? Um, one thing, I see Dr. Smith's hands raised too. Do you want to have Dr. Smith first and then? Sure, and then our... absolutely. Dr. Smith, sorry about that. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, I guess I'll go ahead. Um, I wanted to, um, at least for the sake of completeness, give uh, perspective from administration on jail staffing. Um, you know, we will bring the CGL uh, draft back to you as requested in September. However, I think it's out of date. Um, uh, the, the sheriff's office is definitely going to need additional staffing um, in the near future or immediately. Um, the reason for that is because reality is changing. Um, the board uh, committee knows that the board has been <clears throat> uh, debating whether a new structure will be built. Um, <clears throat> that question mark um, means that um, operations within the main jail north and in Elmwood will continue for some years because even if the board decides to move ahead with um, building a new structure, um, it won't be built expeditiously. So since the staffing in the jails, both jails, is very related to the actual structure of the jail, um, we do need additional staffing compared to what we have now. In addition to that, we know that there is a lag time between creating positions and actually having bodies in positions and we've gone through that many times, so I don't need to go through that, but that will require uh, significant attention and augmentation of the sheriff's custody budget. Um, the CGL study, the reason why I think it's a little dated is because it was done at a time period when our, it was presumed that our census would stay the same after we closed Main Jail South. So I think the presumed census was 3,200. We're now down in the 2,000 range. Um, but that being said, we do have additional needs, which the Sheriff's Office went through in some detail. And we do have problems with transport, uh, not well, a little bit of problem with transport, but uh, transition, uh, access to healthcare, you know, attendance. So um, the 
message that I would like to send to the sheriff's office and to the committee is that I'm expecting from them a proposal for additional staffing. Um, and as soon as they get it, we'll be happy to consider it, get it to the board. Um, obviously, we'll probably end up suggesting less than they asked for. That's sort of typical. But I do think we have some urgency in the issue. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for the um, comments and the urgency of the issues you, you, you have laid out. Uh, sorry, uh, Supervisor Shannon, go ahead. Oh, no, I'll, I'll go after you, Otto. Thank you. Okay, sure. So, um, first of all, I, I uh, would say that uh, certainly would like to take a motion to uh, receive the report from the Office of Sheriff regarding the consent decree compliance and these staff positions. Uh, given since Tuesday, the board has approved direction regarding the jail uh, oversight. The county councils are even asked to provide a public report on the county's compliance uh, with the consent decrees. So I'd like to ask for consent, uh, excuse me, for council to provide the report uh, at the September 21st FDOC special meeting. Uh, the consent decrees indicated the periodic evaluations and reporting of compliance by the county, including the county's response to those uh, type of evaluations. So, uh, so is this something that uh, we could work out, staff? Supervisor Lee, this is Steve Mitra, Assistant County Council. I'll have to take that request back to County Council, and maybe we can uh, talk directly to your office about it. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, thanks. And that's all I have, uh, Supervisor Shab. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll second that, but I wanna make a couple of additions. Um, one is that I would like to request that we, we both get these slides, because if they came to us, I'm sorry, I just didn't get yeah, them. I haven't received them that year yet. That's and then yeah. the second gentleman, I would request that we get a narrative that goes with the slides, because it was, I was trying to follow what you were saying, but I wanna make sure I really deeply understand it. And second, you know, I, I think that the, um, that one of the issues that's been a, a real significant bone of contention for at least since I've been here is this really kind of cracking the nut on when, under what terms and conditions we're using overtime versus um, filling enough vacancies. And, and I have asked in the past for an analysis of that, both from the county staff and from the sheriff's office. And what I've received for the most part has been a list of requests versus the, and by analysis, what I mean is if we're using this much time in overtime, that that equates to not, not just the math of dividing that up over X number of days, but, or X number of hours, but where we're seeing the surge of the need in overtime, you know, is it, you know, you all describe some of the, the units that have particularly high need. And I think that any kind of analysis needs to be so detailed so that we all really are able to deal with apples and apples, because right now for the board, it feels like apples and oranges. I think, you know, we hear one thing from the administration and another, another thing from the sheriff's office. So on that, for that, it, as soon as we could get that analysis would be great. But I, I think um, Supervisor Lee for that special meeting on the 21st, I'd be really interested in understanding the, the tool necessary I mean, the tool you, that we could use that helps us better understand um, how and where to make the investments. That, that's really the outcome I would like to have because I, I've read everything you've sent me. I've read what Dr. Smith sends and Greg, and I, you know, honestly, I, I feel like, I feel like there's still a level, a, a deeper level that we need relative to analysis. So if that could be included in the motion would be really helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chavez. If no further comments, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Um, how many people in public would like to speak today? We do have a request to speak. Please proceed. Sure. Let me, uh, actually, while I'm there, I'm going to turn off that screen share for a second here. Uh -huh. And also, Dr. Smith has his hand up as well. I'm oh, gonna... I'm sorry. Yeah, Dr. Trying to get that to go away. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, the next speaker is Urvish Kumar Mehta. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. 
thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors as well as uh, uh, as well as County of Santa Clara, uh, Sheriff Laurie Smith's office and staff, and to all the captains and commanders. Uh, just wanted to mention about the M4, uh, uh, M4, uh, M8 uh, position as well as the FT positions. I think it's important to classify some of the position under uh, under what. M8, M7, and M4 classification is about, and as well as considering the COVID-19 situation, uh, uh, I certainly see, I certainly foresee that there's a requirement to increase the medical staff at, uh, for, uh, uh, for the jail as uh, the facilities are becoming more and more uh, um, in the terms of maintainability as well as managing the day-to-day -day routines in terms of uh, keeping the sanitization and as well as the medical facilities COVID-free. There's a requirement of medical personnel, not just a medical personnel, the entire medical team that includes nurses, wardian, uh, a doctor, uh, as well as uh, the, the medical staff, as well as the pantry staff. When we reference to any unit uh, that is being run that entire unit is being considered as a management staff, a council staff, uh, as well as a facility maintenance team, uh, medical team, pantry team, and as well as if that particular facility requires any special categorization to be taken care of, that entire staff requires expansion in terms of a facility. As it is a, a jail facility, it is even more becoming more increasingly important to provide the right set of medical staff to and as well as a audience with regards to the specific classification to this. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. And now there was a motion and seconded. Uh, you have to take the vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. I'm sorry, Dr. Smith still had his hand raised. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, Dr. Smith, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I just uh, felt bad when I heard uh, Supervisor uh, Chavez's uh, expression of concern that the administration and sheriff had different messages with regard to overtime. So I wanted to sort of jump in and uh, say, I, I don't think we really have a difference in opinion of priorities. We both think that we need to reduce overtime in some way. Um, it's more a matter of how do we do it and um, the overtime process is a challenging one to attach because it has to do not only with post assignments but also you know volume of need and uh, health care and a lot of other things and um, also getting bodies into positions is challenging so I guess I just wanted to make it clear that I do think we need more positions and I do think that we need to have a faster way of getting bodies into those positions. Um, and I think that will help with the overtime. And Dr. Smith, I really appreciate that. I think what I'm referring to is not today's comments. This is actually the the first time maybe in maybe that I can remember that that there's a concurrence and I think that's very exciting. Um, I think what I was referring back to is for years this debate has been been going on and so one of the one of my hopes is that as you um, working with the sheriff's office come back to the board for these additional positions and frankly um, you know I, I like many of us have been really interested in these um, the academies moving forward, even during kind of tough times, because these are such difficult positions to hire for. And there are some departments, as you know, um, that I think we should overstrengthen and, and some subsets of departments that we have to overstrength. For example, you know, in the CAN Center, we never want to have those phones not staffed with the appropriate skill set, as an example. And that's probably true in the sheriff's office as well. And so what, I, what I'm just asking for is that recognizing the, the points that you raised is just better understanding how each party comes to the conclusion it comes to so that so that the board is is in the best position to understand collectively and even as individuals 
what what we can recommend um, fulsomely, and that that's really what I was trying to get at. But I appreciate the point you're raising that that um, that we're going to come at this in different ways. I, I just want to better understand the math that gets us each party to its recommendation. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. And um, Reggie, go ahead and take the vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Yes. Thank you. All right. Then we move to the next item. Will be item number fifteen. Probably okay. hearing my voice a little bit more. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dave Barry, Chief of Facilities Planning with Facilities and Fleets. Um, I don't know, Supervisor Lee, Supervisor Chavez. Do you want me to go? over the presentation or would you like to skip that and go directly to any questions you might have i think we're on item 15 we can take them out of order if we, we like because uh, uh oh i'm sorry dave are you going to talk about 15. yeah city hall oh i think you know what if you could just because i i think it's important to to get kind of caught up sure let me um share my screen here Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, okay. So, as you can see from this slide here, uh, going through the process of CEQA uh, for the potential demolition of former San Jose City Hall project, um, we are currently in the um, final stages of reviewing DIR uh, based on the comments that we received and. Um, we are, um, I'm working with County Council Lizanne Reynolds, who's also here today, and we are finishing that up. Then we need to take it to the Historical Heritage Commission regarding a landmark alteration permit, and then we will return to the board in the fall with a formal recommendation regarding the former San Jose City Hall facility. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. That that's all my comments that I have about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Dave, that was uh, short and sweet. Um, so, Vice Chavez, do you have any uh, questions on this yeah, item? Yeah, and like um, just one. Um, my one question is that. Um, have we reached out to Pack SJ as part of your outreach program? Yes, it, it, we've we've been um, we've reached out to Pack SJ throughout this process, and we've got extensive comments from them, which will be addressed in the final EIR. Excellent, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Sergio Chavez. And actually, I have no further questions on this item. And uh, let's see, I have a motion. A so move. And I'll second it, and I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Anybody would like to speak on this in the public? There are no requests to speak. Okay, I'll close the public hearing, and let's go take a vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes. And Chairperson Lee. Yes, as well. Thank you. All right, and moving to basically our last item today, which is item number 16, Receiving a quarterly report from the Office of County Executive and Facilities and Fleet Department relating to status of the fairgrounds last of planning process. I believe today we have um, Mr. Glenn Williams, um, NASA Developing Manager here, um, to present. Am I correct? You also have me again. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave. You're still here. Good. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, uh, you know, Chairperson Lee and Supervisor Travis. Good afternoon. Uh, Glenn Williams with uh, as Asset Development Manager for the County in the County Executive's Office. And also available today, of course, we have uh, Dave Berry from FAF if there are questions relative to their role. And Mr. Abraham Andrade, who's the Executive Director of FMC, which is our uh, manager for the fairgrounds facility. Uh, I'll be very brief. I don't have 
uh, the graphics, uh, the lovely graphics capability of other presenters such as Dave. So it's just the facts, ma'am. Uh, we have, uh, just as a, a brief uh, introduction, of course, as you all know, the, in the terms of the short term for the fairgrounds, we are using virtually all of the facilities at this point uh, that are uh, not under long-term uh, other use for public health, you know, for vaccinations, for uh, the testing, and for uh, housing, uh, as well as for uh, some training purposes for public health that will be coming up next month. In terms of the future of that, it is anticipated that we will be using all of those facilities at least through the fall and well into 2022. So there are no major events that are being booked for the fairgrounds currently. Uh, there are a few minor ones that don't interfere with other purposes. Uh, in terms of the long term, we have three things that are moving forward at this point in terms of long term planning for the fairgrounds. Uh, which I believe both of you are uh, familiar with. One, of course, is the San Jose earthquakes that are proposed to lease 25 acres of the fairgrounds in order to construct uh, so eight soccer fields and a two or three story field building. Uh, the board has authorized us to uh, pursue uh, nego further negotiations with them. Those, neg ah, those negotiations are currently in progress. The second item is the American Cricket uh, Enterprises in possible partnership with San Jose Giants. Those are also uh, moving forward. We will be beginning uh, official negotiations with them uh, coming up in the next few weeks. The third, of course, and the one that has the bulk of the materials that you, are, that you have in front of you as part of this item, is the indoor sports facility that the San Jose Sports Authority has expressed a great deal of interest in. We contracted with C.H. Johnson to produce a draft report evaluating the market demand for such a facility in the range of 120 to 160,000 square feet. That report has been produced and is has delivered uh, that in a draft form, which you have as part of your package. Uh, mm -hmm. Administration and FMC are both continuing to review that uh, presentation and determine what, what if any of those we accept and what of those we want further information about. Uh, and we will be bringing back to FGOC uh, a set of recommendations based upon our evaluation. And that's my presentation and we're open to any questions you may have. Thank you, Glenn, uh, for the presentation. And uh, I'll go ahead and ask if uh, Supervisor Chavez, do you have any questions on the uh, fairgrounds? Um, I, I don't have questions. I, I have a, a couple of um, requests that I'd like to make. One is that I'm very interested in the, us keeping this on a, on a monthly um, meeting. And monthly, I'd, I'd be very interested in getting the utilization of the fairgrounds, particularly during COVID-19, because I know it's dramatically impacting our ability to um, to do other activities, but as appropriate to get updates on all three of the projects and the and the um, finances of the of the fairgrounds. Um, and then secondly, uh, you know, I, I'm particularly interested in the financing mechanism for the, the 74,000 square foot building on the facility. If you know, actually reading Charlie's report was um, fascinating in the sense that um, you know, that th from a, a market perspective, I think it's very interesting to um, see what what could be paid for. But when I looked at each of the financial um, analysis, it was hard to understand how debt service was going to be serviced from the from the facility. And so, you know, I, I'd be interested in some some debt service strategies that I recognize may be connected to the entire development of the site. Um, so, so I think that's going to be really important, even if that means that's a fourth body of work that looks at if these projects come in, this is what the facility investments overall can look like. And I think that should both be included as it relates to this particular facility, this additional facility, 
but also as it relates to any offsite improvements that are going to be necessary to make that the, the whole property work. So those are two additions of bodies of work that I'd at least like to see scoped out in the next month and then come back um, to the board with whatever, if there are consulting services that are required from the county side with the fairgrounds or uh, you know, with, with FMC or the, they, that work can be done separately. I, I just don't know the answer to that, um, but I'm very interested in getting um, you know, both Glenn, your thoughts on that and also Abe, your thoughts on that. Absolutely, we'd be happy to do that. That's obviously part of what we will be uh, doing in our evaluation anyway. Uh, and we did extend C.H. Uh, Johnson's contract prior to the end of uh, June so that we have him under contract for an additional 12 months through June of 22. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Lee and uh, Chair, Vice Chair Chairperson Chavez, uh, Abe Andrade, Executive Director of the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds Management Corporation. Uh, happy to be able to be here today to present uh, uh, the the follow-up on the uh, various projects that are that we are in various stages of negotiation for the development of the uh, within the Santa Clara Fairgrounds properties. Uh, as a follow-up to your to your uh, comments, uh, Supervisor Chavez, uh, we we are uh, bringing forward to the board to our FMC board in this next meeting. Uh, uh, consulting contract uh, that will assist us in uh, in performing a financial analysis and also uh, studies on uh, on the various uh, uh, negotiations that we're entering into uh, both with cricket and the indoor sports facility uh, in addition to what uh, Charlie Johnson's uh, also uh, entering uh, completing for us as well uh, we are looking forward to uh, coming back uh, to the Board of Supervisors uh, in the very near term, uh, hopefully uh, that we have uh, uh, both uh, uh, another uh, uh, term sheet with the American Cricket Enterprise, uh, Major League Cricket, and also uh, uh, additional information on the indoor sports facility as well. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, um, specifically the the issue that I'm concerned about, and just to be to be very direct, I don't I don't want to wait a year um, to get the the financing mechanism on the outdoor facility. And I, I heard um, Mr. Williams say, "Well, obviously we're going to do that next." What was a concern to me was that it wasn't reflected in the report. You know, and I read the report yesterday, but it wasn't reflected in the report that the. the that the that there was any sort of understanding about how debt service would need to be integrated into the into the overall program. So I'm glad you said it was obvious. It wasn't to me because I, I read it with thinking, I don't know, you know, it, it was unclear to me. And the second issue, and I just want to really emphasize this, is that the the offsite improvements are not they're going to be significant in order to get additional um, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're not going to be significant necessarily for us. I mean, relative to the overall development of the site, they're going to be significant because so much of the ingress and egress will need to be restructured in order for that to really be smooth. And the other thing that I really just want to put on the table that we're going to have to think about is the connection of the offsite property, you know, to the 15 acres across the street to the current fairgrounds um, site. If, if, for example, there needs to be um, shared parking opportunities that are much safer and easier to get across than are, are there right now. So that, that's what, when I'm talking about those offsite improvements, that's something I'm really interested in. And I, I think it would be of significant value while all of that is being uh, discussed and scoped out that we look to partners like the Valley Transportation Authority and other partners who could have impacts on the property that um, that I'm sure you're already talking to, but I'm going to be really interested in better understanding what kinds of investments they're willing to make as well, you know, to enhance the um, the 
the, the ability for us to really engage folks to make investments in the fairgrounds. And then the one last thing I'm going to raise is that we have gone back and forth on this in term formally. And I, I don't know if Dr. Smith is still with us today, but I see Miguel. Um, uh, so Mr. Marquez, just as a reminder, one of the things that an issue that um, was brought up by the board a while ago was how much of this land, if any, should be designated as parkland. And I raise that because when you look at the overall vision of the board, there was a significant interest in large portions of this being open public, uh, I'm sorry, open access public, public um, access for low cost or free. And that in my mind fits into the parks realm. So the other department that I wanna make sure we're engaging is parks to determine whether or not there's any sort of investments that make sense for parks to make given the size of this property relative to the size of, of other properties that we've made investments in, in more urban environments. So uh, that's, those are my requests and I'd like to get some semblance of an approach by our next meeting in September. And that would be my motion. And I'll second it. Do you have any more comments for the advisor Chavez? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, one question I have is uh, about the backlog uh, on the maintenance. Uh, apparently, there's been some backlog on that. Can you um, let us know what's going on there? I will do my best. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, as you know, this is a facility that's 80 years old. And many of the buildings on this property are anywhere from 50 to 60 years old. So uh, FAF did it had a consultant come in and do an evaluation of the physical facilities of the you know of the buildings that are there, and they have uh, and they're about to go out on a uh, with a consultant to do an analysis of the utility infra infrastructure in the ground. Uh, the report on the buildings indicated that over the next five years to bring them up to uh, you know standards would require approximately 53 million dollars uh, which in many cases of the buildings are more than the buildings themselves would cost to rebuild so in part that's uh, a, a piece of what drives this uh, desire for us to begin to replace or uh, increase the sh structures on the buildings on the fairgrounds property so that they can continue to serve the community needs that uh, exist. Uh, and as you know, part of the uh, two buildings that Charlie was recommending in that report that is enclosed uh, is not only the 120, 140,000 square foot sports facility building, but a 75,000 square foot additional building for use for general purposes by fairgrounds and, and events, uh, which would take some of the pressure off of the existing structures as well. The immediate need in that report that gave uh, 53 million was a, approximately a million and a half of, of uh, stage one uh, repairs and maintenance that needed to be done immediately. Uh, so the rest, you know, are staggered out over stage two, stage three, stage four. Uh, the FAF and the county have allocated, uh, not separately, but with an understanding that up to, you know, $2 million a year within the maintenance and uh, capital budgets of FAF would be allocated towards fairgrounds. And this last year, FAF has uh, produced uh, a number of repairs and maintenance items for the fairgrounds in spite of the limitations under uh, the current uh, COVID-19 protocols. Uh, they've replaced roofs on at least three buildings on the fairgrounds. They've done work on HVAC systems. They've done, they're scheduled to do a portion of the paving of the center uh, section in between exposition and pavilion hall. Uh, that was put on hold because of public health and the public health department felt it would be too disruptive for them to be doing those repairs in advance. 
Uh, so, and of course, you know, last year uh, upgrades were made to all of the uh, electrical uh, hookups that were considered to be substandard or needed to be um, brought up to code. So those were done as well. I think FAF can, in, at this point is still planning to continue to do the $2 million a year for us to correct glaring deficiencies and things that are urgent and needed. Uh, and then the balance of repairs and or upgrades, I think need to be considered in the context of an overall plan for what will be done with the fairgrounds that we're talking about and how the long-term plans, how those buildings fit into the long-term plans. And if you need more detail on that, I think Dave is available to answer further questions about FAF school. Thank you. And if, if I may, uh, Chairman Lee, if I just may, just a couple of more comments. Uh, I, I do want to also uh, report out that uh, uh, in support of the vaccination and the continued uh, testing of the COVID programming, uh, the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds Management Corporation has canceled and or uh, uh, put on hold uh, approximately 56 uh, events for the balance of the year. Uh, totaling close to a million dollars in revenues. And I uh, just want to uh, make report that out for the record and to also report out that we have uh, issued uh, two invoices uh, totaling approximately $3.2 million uh, going back to March of 20, uh, 2021, excuse me, 2020 uh, for the use of the facilities uh, and representing uh, lost revenue uh, to the Fairgrounds Management Corporation. And we're hoping that uh, the county uh, reviews those invoices and finds uh, funding uh, within uh, to compensate the Fairgrounds Management Corporation uh, for the loss of those revenues as well. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Andrade. Um, okay, all right. And I think that's the, oh, uh, one more question I have. Regarding the, uh, uh, the sports uh, negotiation, uh, you mentioned that you'll be bringing it back to us. Can you give us some estimated timeline? Uh, when do you think the, uh, let's say for the cricket uh, negotiation, when do you think you might have something to bring to the board? I don't have a specific date for you, I'm not sure personally. Uh, in terms of the status of the negotiations, um, I mean, we're, we're meeting next week, for example, with the earthquakes, and that will be, uh, you know, that the status of that discussion is much further along than the discussion with uh, the uh, folks at Cricket, okay? And so I would not anticipate having a, uh, a, a, an agreed upon deal sheet or something that we're ready to present to the board for cricket uh, until later in the fall. But uh, we're certainly going to do everything we can to move that forward as quickly as possible and bring it back to uh, in probably just the same as we did with the earthquakes, which is to bring that to closed session and get advice from the full board. Um, and it, Super uh, Chairperson uh, Lee, you know, it should be noted that we have been working closely both not only with the earthquakes, but also with the Major League Cricket and Major League Cricket has uh, provided us with an LOI as well as a, a draft term sheet uh, that we'd like to bring forward to the Board of Supervisors as soon as possible. And uh, that will involve us, uh, including both uh, the, uh, the county Exec's office as well as county council in order to bring those forward to the board. But Major League Cricket is on board with us and uh, uh, would certainly like us to move forward as quickly as possible with those negotiations uh, in order to possibly host the 2026 uh, World Cup here at the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds. Right, thank you, Mr. Andrade. I, I have the same, uh, same comments uh, from the Cricket representative uh, this past Saturday when I was up there doing my first pitch uh, in the Morgan Hill facilities. Uh, I have to go to YouTube to look up how to throw a cricket ball. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, 
thank you for the for the update. And uh, now um, here's a dumb question here, Mr. Williams, is that all of these different projects, they don't conflict with each other, right? You could actually, we could actually get all of those uh, desired fulfilled, correct? Now they're not occupying competing, you know, the same space. They are, right. they are, they are complementary uses to the fairgrounds. Right. And so it's a function of defining where there may be potential for overlap or potential for cooperation. And so it becomes more complicated, but no, there's no, no direct conflict between all three of these. Great, all right, thank you. And that the cricket and the baseball will be sharing the space, correct? Well, that's, it's under discussion. Uh, you know, they have to agree before we can. Of course, of course. So, okay, they, at this they, point, they are, they're, they're not yet the in San agreement. Jose Giants, they, both the San Jose Giants and the, and the Major League Cricket are looking at the possibility of joint, of a joint use stadium. What is the possibility? How would you be able to retrofit the, uh, the, uh, the stadium on a short-term basis, either for baseball and or for cricket? And looking at what the possibilities of are. So, yes. Thank you very much, Abe. Okay, good. And that basically is all the questions I have. Um, we have a motion and a second. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Do if anybody would like to speak? Yes, we do have a request to speak. Uh, the next speaker is Urbish Kumar Mehta. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to all the Board of Supervisors. Uh, as well as the, the county uh, development department. I think what I wanted to emphasize on uh, the three projects that's coming up. First is the San Jose earthquake. Uh, when any facility uh, in terms of a fairgrounds uh, development uh, that is being considered, one is to consider that if that facility is to remain there and is being a part of a county of Santa Clara, whether to lease or whether to own the facility that would be very important in terms of a development, in terms of in terms of a development of, of a sports development specifically, as building indoor facility and, and having an external facility converting into a sports facility park or a recreational facility always being considered to be a better utilization of a space and as well as open uh, open space and as well as the facilitation of a recreational facility for the community service purposes. Hence, it is to it is to point out that that indoor facility operates differently than the facilities which is being designated as a recreational facility as a part of a sports development facilities. Now, when part of a second when developing a facility of American cricket and as well as uh, the indoor facility development. Sometimes it is being considered that when indoor facilities are being developed, they are mostly being they are mostly either being leased based upon the utilization, whether that sports facility is being utilized utilized as a commercial facility, for example, as uh, the SEP uh, the SEP center at the uh, at the San Jose. In the same way, if the facility is being utilized as a commercialized property uh, commercialized facility sports facility. Then it is to be it is to be validated that, that the how lease versus owning concept works and how the funding is to be granted in terms for the development. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Let's go take a vote. Vice Chairperson Chavez. Yes, thank you. And Chairperson Lee. Yes, as well. Thank you. Okay, now I think we move to basically the end of our agenda, um, which is item uh, number, basically to adjournment. Uh, and I believe our next meeting uh, is going to be on September 16th at 2 p.m. So I motion to adjourn. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Otto. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Thank you. Recording stopped.